Amen. It is, it is fascinating to, to see the work of the Lord that is going on uh, in the country. This uh, revival seems to have broken out at Asbury. It's been fascinating to watch that. Basically, what happened was there's a chapel service uh, that is seven days still going. It just, uh, it was just, it's just continuing 24 hours a day worship, and people are, are going. They're coming from all over the country. They're coming from all over the world. People are coming in uh, from other continents to, to see what the Lord is doing there, begin to spill out into other uh, places and other places of worship, other colleges, as uh, Pastor Brandon was mentioning. I think that's really important to keep that in mind, especially what we're going to be talking about this morning. A lot of what our focus is going to be on this morning is on the forces of darkness and how they work and operate in our lives as we unpack that. But to remember, the light is at work. God is at work. And when God is at work, He's at work by His Spirit through His people as we participate in the powerful work of the gospel in our own lives. So this, this series that we're on is about spiritual warfare uh, called Against the Darkness. We've been on this for a number of weeks in Ephesians chapter 6. We open that time together where we are reading that the Apostle Paul is instructing all of us to be strong because we find ourselves in the situation of a battle. And if we're going to be in the midst of warfare, we need to be strong, but not in the strength of ourselves but in the strength of the Lord and the power of His might to be adorned with the armor of Christ, the armor of God, that we might stand against the evil one and against his schemes, which we focused last week a bit on who is our great enemy, the, the captain of the evil forces and Satan, and what are some of his schemes. We'll be exploring that in greater detail in the weeks to come. This morning, we're going to be looking into verse 12, because what verse 12 does in Ephesians chapter 6 is it unpacks in, in, in greater detail what, how do we understand the spiritual forces that are against us. And the Apostle Paul begins to give some titles to them, and we want to see where, how does Scripture deal with that? What is Paul talking about? And how do we then understand in our own lives, how do we stand with Christ against these evil forces? So again, the reading is... Ephesians 6, starting in verse 10 through verse 12. I know we're just standing, but I invite you to stand again. If you're new to Cornerstone, we stand in honor of the Word, stand in honor of its reading. The Apostle Paul says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And though the grass withers and the flower fades, the word of our Lord remains forever. Please be seated and let's pray. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you be present with us. Thank you that you have inspired this in all of Scripture as it is breathed out by you. We pray that this morning that you be present in our hearts and in this place that you'd open up our eyes, our ears, and our hearts. Otherwise, we're blind, we're deaf, and we can't understand. Apart from you, we can do no good thing. But in and because of you, all things are possible. We do see, we do hear, we understand. And we're turned and we transform. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning's message is entitled, Something Wicked This Way Comes. As we're exploring some of these spiritual forces of evil that have been described as coming against us in Christ. Now, this is important because we live in a world that is increasingly described with the language of disenchanted. And what authors mean when they say our culture is disenchanted is there's an increasing denial of anything that exists beyond the physical, anything beyond what I can see and touch and experience. So if I can't see it, touch it, experience through my senses, then it's not real. It's just figments of our imagination. Hey, we're modern people, okay? So we don't have to believe in fairies and we don't have to believe in the God who makes thunderbolts and all that stuff. That's all hogwash. We are people of the world and so we don't need to believe in that anymore. But the Bible says otherwise. One author who wrote a book called The Death of Satan, he said, in our disenchanted world, one that, in that world, one respected historian uh, said that mass murders like Holland, uh, speak now, 
Mass murderers like Hitler and Stalin require us to, quote, judiciously to distinguish mental disorders that incapacitate from streaks of disorder that should not diminish responsibility. The author goes on to say, what does it mean to say that the inventor of the concentration camps or of the gulag was subject to a, quote, disorder? What does it mean? to call these monsters mentally disordered and to engage in scholastic debate over whether their brand of madness vitiates their responsibility. Why can we no longer simply call them evil? Evil is real, brothers and sisters. Is it enough to say that on Monday, a gentleman decided to go across the street in Lansing on the MSU campus and start killing people randomly, that he was simply mentally disordered. Now, I am not denying the reality of mental disorders, and there are things that are real out there. I'm not saying that every single time you see someone that has a, a mental disorder, well, you must have a demon. But what I'm saying is, is the category of mental disorder is not a big enough category to, in order for us as believers to understand what is going on in the world. Evil is real. Evil is at work. And the Apostle Paul says that our battle is not against flesh and blood. Our battle is not against that which we can see, taste, and experience. He says that what we're at war against are spiritual forces of evil. So we went together to talk, what are these powers? How does the Apostle Paul talk about them? How do they operate? We're going to look at one way in which they operate. I'm not saying it's the only way. And how do we begin to resist them? At least one way of thinking about that, not the only way. What are these powers that the Apostle Paul is talking about? He says in verse 12, uh, with a number of clauses, he describes them in different ways. Probably the, the largest category is what comes last, that these are spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. This helps us understand. Whatever has come before, remember, these are not physical things, right? They're not flesh and blood. They are spiritual, the unseen realm, and they are against the Lord and His goodness. He then, you know, given that kind of general category of spiritual forces of evil, he calls them rulers and authorities. So whatever these titles are, they are spiritual and they are against the Lord. Now, this can be used in Scripture of human rulers and things. So it's, this is a specifically being applied to spiritual powers, spiritual authorities against God. It's not the only place in Scripture it's used. Another place in Scripture where these titles are used in this sequence and order of rulers, authorities, and powers is in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, 1 Corinthians 15 is the chapter of the Bible that most of any chapter unpacks the reality of Christ's resurrection. And it says that Jesus will be coming back. And when he does, it says, then he comes the end at the return of Christ, and he will deliver the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule, every authority, and every power. You see, Jesus on the cross has already been victorious over these spiritual forces, but he will be, will be completely destroyed when Jesus returns. Until then, what is he doing? He's reigning. For he must reign until... He has put all things under his feet. So Jesus is reigning, and when he returns to consummate his kingdom, all these forces will be destroyed. And in Ephesians, we saw it in chapter 6, it uses these titles. It uses in two other places, in chapter 3 and in chapter 1. And in chapter 1, it says something very similar to the book of 1 Corinthians. Chapter 15, he says that he, God the Father, raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So Jesus is right now in the heavenly places at the right hand of his Father, and he is above all of his enemies. He is above every rule. He is above these authorities. He is above these powers. So when you're at the right hand of God, you are reigning, and just as 1 Corinthians 15 says, he's reigning above his enemies because he has been brought far above them. He doesn't say he's kind of at par with them. We'll see how this turns out. He is far above them. He's above every name that is named in this age and in the age to come. So these rulers and authorities are very real. 
They are powerful. Jesus is reigning above them, and the end, when it comes, will completely destroy them. He also describes them using this phrase, cosmic powers. Now, I'm going to show you the Greek word, not to appear smart, but just to show it to you, because this word is kind of unique. So the word that's translated cosmic powers is a Greek word. Actually, it's two Greek words smashed together to form one word. One is the Greek word cosmos. You probably heard that word, cosmos. It just means world. And then krator. So krator means uh, to rule. Or at least it can mean that. That's what it means here. So it's like, that's why it says cosmic powers. Some people use world rulers and other types of translations. The thing that's interesting is this word, cosmo krator, is never used again in the Bible. It's only used one time. It's never used in the Old Testament, Septuagint translation. It's never used in sacred scripture apart from this one time. Now, that presents a bit of a problem when it comes to interpretation, because normally what you do is you look where a word is used, you look in other places of scripture where it's used, and then you begin to understand what sacred scripture means by this term. But when it's only used once, you can't do that. You can't turn to another place and go, what's used here, there, so that's what it means here. So the question is, where is, this, where is Paul getting this term? And when you look into the culture of the first century, which is Greco-Roman, this term exists outside in the Greco-Roman culture in reference specifically to pagan gods. Pagan gods. I'm going to show you some examples. One is an inscription found on a Roman bathhouse. It says there's one Zeus, Serapis, Helios, Cosmocrator, world ruler, unconquerable. So these are pagan gods. Helios means sun. Zeus, Serapis, well, real quick, Serapis is basically a Ptolemy invention which smashes together Zeus and Osiris together, and you get Serapis. Psh, Serapis comes out. <laughs> which sort of makes sense because Ptolemy, right? Alexander the Great comes in. Greek, Alexander the Great is Greek. He, he overruns the Persian Empire, which includes Egypt. So the, if you're going to rule over Egypt and you're a Greek guy and you want to have legitimacy, you're going to take a Greek god and a Roman god, I'm sorry, a Greek god and an Egyptian god, you smash them together. That's why you've got Serapis. But notice what they're called. They're called world rulers. They're called cosmocrators. the same word that's used by Paul. Another example is a, uh, an incantation, a magical incantation where someone's casting a spell, really an incantation, to bless an object. We found this in, the, in this ancient papyrus. I invoke you, the greatest God, eternal Lord, world ruler. There's that word. Who are over the world and under the world, give glory and favor to this phylactery, give to this amulet. So he's calling on a pagan God, and he's calling him this title. One other place, again, calling on Serapis. I call on you, Lord, holy, my hymned, greatly honored world ruler. Here's that title again, Serapis. Consider my birth, turn me not away, apportion me good things for me in my horoscope. See, even back then, you know, how's my horoscope? I'm a, whatever. I'm a Pisces, here we go. Increase my life and may I enjoy many good things for I am your slave. Now, the point of all this is that what Paul is doing is he is pulling out a term that, remember, he's in Ephesus. That's a Greek town. What did they, what, in Ephesus, remember who they worshipped in Ephesus? Artemis. Artemis, yeah, greatest Artemis of the Ephesians. One of the seven wonders of the world was the temple to Artemis in Ephesus. So he's pulling out a term that the Greeks who are reading this would have recognized. Oh, he's talking about the gods. He's talking about Serapis. He's talking about Helios. He's talking about Zeus. He's talking about all these gods. And he describes these gods as being spiritual forces of evil. So hold that in, because now we're going to talk about how do these spiritual forces work? How do they operate? And I think the Apostle Paul is going to show us something here in the, his letter to the Corinthians, which is going to help us understand how they operate not only then, but how do they operate now in our lives, in the world around us. And this is going to come from a, a passage of Scripture where Paul is going to be dealing with meat offered to idols. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 through 10, he's talking about meat offered to idols. And he opens up that conversation by saying, therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no existence, and there is no God but one. 
For although there may be many so-called gods in heaven and earth, as indeed there are gods, indeed there are lords, but for us there is one God. For us there is one. But he seems to recognize the existence of other gods, other lords. What does he mean by that? He begins to unpack that in greater measure later in 1 Corinthians 10. He says, what do I imply? That food offered to idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons. When pagans offer sacrifices to Zeus and to Serapis and Artemis, these cosmocrators, these world rulers, they are not offering it up to what they think they're offering it up to. They're offering it up to demons. I don't want you to have participation with demons. Now, that word participation, if you know some Greek too, is the word koinonia. I don't want you to have fellowship. It's what we have with God. We have koinonia with God. We have koinonia and fellowship with one another. Paul says that when you offer up worship to these gods, you are actually having fellowship not with what you think. So when Paul says there's no such thing as these idols, uh, here's the question. Okay, I'm a Greek, and I'm worshiping Artemis, and I'm in this huge temple, and I offer a sacrifice to Artemis is the statue in front of me actually Artemis? No. Is there a real being called Artemis in that somewhere? I'm a Greek. Yes, they do think that. They think there really is an Artemis. They think there really is a Zeus. They think that when the thunderbolt comes down, Zeus is throwing… That's what they really think. Now, Paul, does Paul say there is something, Artemis is real? No, Artemis is not real. Zeus is not real. There is no Zeus. There is no Artemis. There is no Diana. Okay, these things are fake. That's what you can say. An idol is nothing. But are demons real? And he says, that, okay, those things are nothing, but when you sacrifice to these other gods, there is reality behind them. One commentator, Gordon Fee, says, what the Corinthians had failed to discern is that to say an idol is not a god, there is no Zeus, does not mean that that does not represent supernatural powers. Indeed, it's quite the opposite. There are powers at work in and through these things, and when we, offer, when we worship idols, we have participation with spiritual forces of evil. When we worship idols, we have participation with the spiritual forces of evil. Psalm 96, tell the nations about the splendor of the Lord. Tell the nations about His amazing deeds, for the God is great and certainly worthy of praise. He is more awesome than all the gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols. Now, what's very interesting is verse 5 is, for all the gods of the nations are idols. When the Greek translators, who translated the Hebrew into Greek, translated the word idol into Greek, and there is a Greek word for idol, they didn't translate it into the Greek word for idol. They translated it into the Greek word for demon. All the gods of the nations are demons. There are spiritual forces of evil that are at work when humanity offers itself to worship something other than God, they are worshiping spiritual forces of evil, and there is power at work behind that. Pastor Tim Keller, pastor of Redeemer Church out in New York, says, idols are nothing. Isaiah is clear on that. Isaiah says, idols are nothing. But through them, the powers and principalities, these world rulers, these spiritual forces of evil at work in the present evil age, these forces control us. They're a darkness. That's the reason why, on the one hand, idols are nothing. There, are, are, this statue to Artemis is nothing. There is no Artemis. But on the other hand, they're unbelievably powerful because the spiritual forces of evil are real. They're real. And they are all too happy, by the way, to offer you the same deal they'll offer anybody else. I got a deal for you. 
I got a deal for you. The devil loves to make deals. Evil's real. I'll give you an example from Scripture. You saw the map came up for a second. Let me describe what that's about. This is from the Scriptures, the Old Testament, in the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings is Ahab is just died. Remember King Ahab? Right, not the captain from Moby Dick, right? The king, Ahab. Was he good or bad? Remember, what's his wife's name? Jezebel. So Ahab, good or bad? He's in with Jezebel more than Ahab sometimes. He's bad. Ministered uh, during the life, uh, he didn't minister, but Elijah ministered during him. So Elijah was at the same time as Ahab. Ahab dies, and his son comes on the throne. His name is Joram, Jehoram, depending on which you read, Jehoram. And when King Ahab dies and his son comes on the throne, the kingdom of Moab rebels. So Moab is a vassal nation of Israel, and they rebel, and they rise up against Israel. And King Jehoram says, this isn't good. I've got to squash this. And he goes down to the southern kingdom of Judah. So they're split, goes down to Judah, the King Jehoshaphat. And he says, hey, Jehoshaphat, we're buds, right? Why don't we go down together, and let's put down this rebellion of Moab. Will you join me? Jehoshaphat says, Yes. I'll do that. And they traveled down, and they passed through the kingdom of Edom. And on their way through Edom, they say, hey, Edom, we're going over to Moab. We're going to put down this rebellion. Will you join us? And Edom says, sure. And here's what, it just showed the map of what this looks like. So you've got Israel, Judah, and Edom. They, so they come into the kingdom of Moab, which is purple, and it's three on one. Do you think Edom's going to win? Three on one. Right, you're silent because it's the Bible. You never really know. Will they win? <laughs> Humanly speaking, they should not win. It's three on one. And the king of Edom is fighting against, I'm sorry, the king of Moab is fighting against both Israel, Judah, and Edom all together. And he's losing. And he should lose because it's, it's three on one. And it says they're losing. And at one point here in verse 26, when the king of Moab saw that the battle was going against them, how could it not? He took with him 700 swordsmen to break through opposite the king of Edom, and they couldn't. He was definitely going to lose. And then he gets desperate. And here's what he does. The king of Moab takes his oldest son, who was to reign in his place, and he makes a sacrifice out of him. He kills his son as a sacrifice to his God. Does it work? Yes. Then there came great wrath against Israel, and they withdrew from him, and they returned to their own land. Did it work? Yeah, it did. Think about being in Egypt. This is why we need to understand, these are real forces. They have power. When, they, when, when Moses and Aaron go into Egypt and they confront Pharaoh, they do these magical signs, right? That the staff becomes a snake and all that, right? Could the magicians in Pharaoh's Egypt do it? Yes. There's real power there. When the devil comes to make a deal with you, this is where it gets a little tr tricky. Can he make good on his deal? So, he, okay, so you, he comes to you and says, hey, I know that you really want to be honored by others. You know, I, want, I know that you want to be successful. Make a deal with me. Can he make good on that? I, 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 I know that you really, you know, this relationship with your wife or your husband is not working out and you're unsatisfied. I can offer you something that will satisfy you. Does the devil make those kind of deals? Has he ever come to you to make those kind of deals? Yeah, sure he has. The thing is, there's oftentimes short-term benefits. Benefits. Just like drugs, right? Okay, I do one hit, two hits, all of a sudden my life's over. He'll come to you, yeah, I'll, I'll make your life better. This isn't working out with your wife? Just look at these images. You'll get all the... You know. By the way, men, women, listen to me. Pornography is opening you up to spiritual things of evil. Let's just be honest. Don't play around. Young people, don't play around. It's real things. They'll come to you, oh, yeah, I'll offer you life. I'll offer this to you. It will end things for you. That's, I think, part of why Jesus says, look, what can a profit a man? 
A prophet, a person, a woman. And, and not just in those ways, other ways. You can gain the whole world. Satan will come. Didn't Satan offer Jesus the whole world, literally? Here's all the kingdoms of the earth. I'll give them to you. Could he make good on it? Did they belong to him? Maybe that'll be next week. Come back tonight, maybe we'll talk about that question. Did they belong to him? What did it profit a man if he gains the whole world but forfeits its soul? What shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come. Look, there's going to be judgment. He's going to come with his angels and the glory of his Father, and he'll repay to each person according to what he's done. These are real things, folks. He's going to come to you, and he's going to offer you life, and he's going to deliver you to you death. It will leave you empty. It will leave you alone. And it will leave you, I hate to use this word, pathetic. Because that's what the devil wants for you. That's what the devil wants for you. So how do we resist? What, what do we do? How do we... There are so many things to say here. How do we resist? Let me suggest to you at least one way that we resist. We resist by drawing near to the Lord. You know, that's sort of how predators work. He's described as a lion, right? A lion is a predator, fair? How does a lion go about which one of the herd it's going to attack? Now, some people say it attacks the weakest one. What it really is, apparently, as they've studied this, they, they attack the one that gets separated out. Now, often is the weakest one. So when you're together, you're safe. But when you scatter, then you're in trouble. To resist, we draw near to our God. We draw near to the Lord. And we keep tight fellowship with Him. I'll give you a couple of just examples. The Lord says, basically, look, you need to be on my side. Are there sides here? Do we need to choose a side? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. As an example, then we're going to close. Sorry, give me a few seconds to develop this. Exodus. What chapter of Exodus is the Ten Commandments given? Chapter 20. So remember, they come out of Egypt in the beginning. Song of Moses, as they pass through the sea in chapter 15. They come out to Sinai. Chapter 19, God comes down with the Ten Commandments. And he tells the people of Israel, here's, basically, here's the deal. I'm the God who delivered you. I'm the one who's brought you out from bondage to Pharaoh. Will you be my people? Here's what it means to be my people. You need to obey me. Here's what it means to obey me. And we'll have a, a relationship together, but will you be my people? Yes or no? And the people say, yes, I will be your people. But they already had, they had the Ten Commandments, right? So then Moses goes up on the mountain. How long has he gone? Forty days. Too long? Apparently, because all the people started getting like, well, what's going on? Where'd this Moses guy go? What's the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. What's the second commandment? You shall not make an image. Anything in the heavens above, the earth beneath, the waters under the earth, you shall not bow down nor serve them, for I am the Lord your God. What's the third commandment? You shall not bear the name of the Lord in vain. They break all three within 40 days. Moses comes down off the mountain, and he finds the people at play. Now, that's the euphemism there, at play. You know, because the thing is, when we give our lives over to demons, it affects everything. We get, we get pulled into darkness. The book of Ephesians says that we can't even speak of what people do in darkness because it's so shameful. And we give ourselves over to those forces, we begin to do things that are shameful. And our lives begin to turn into darkness. Moses comes down off the mountain. He sees the people being twisted into darkness. And when he comes down, he comes down to the foot of the mountain. And he says, he saw the people breaking loose. And he stood at the gate of the camp. He says, who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. You see, I think that Jesus this morning wants to say, you know, there's, sp there's spiritual forces of evil at work. Are you on my side? Come to me. Be near to me. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount that you cannot serve two masters. There is no fence. You can't say, well, I got one foot in the world and I got one foot with God. I worship on Sundays and I got my mistress on Wednesdays. I'm, I, you know, I'm. If anyone's here is doing that, 
And I'm not, you know, I'm not talking about where you're repenting and you're turning and you're struggling. Look, we repent, we turn, and we struggle. I'm not talking to people that live that. The Bible says you're not. It, that does not exist. If you think you can have one foot with God and one foot in the world, guess what? You've got two feet in the world. Two feet. Jesus says you can't serve two masters. Either you're for me or you are. For either you will hate the one and love the other, you'll be devoted to one, you'll despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, interestingly, the word here that's described as money is not the same. So other places, Jesus says that the Pharisees are lovers of money. It's not the same word. The word here is the word mammon. It's very much like saying you cannot worship both God and Plutus. Plutus is the Greek god for wealth. Here, mammon is a deity. Mammon is a god. Mammon is a world ruler, to use Paul's language, and he says, you cannot worship me and worship mammon at the same time. You cannot be devoted to me and be devoted to another source of salvation, another source of security, another source of life. As believers, we go to one place for life. Where do we go to for life, believers? Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ only. When other things present themselves to us as sources of life. Now, I'm not talking about, hey, I, I love the Lord my God and He is my God and the Lord my God gives me gifts and they're good. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is where we go to for life for salvation, for security, not the good gifts that God gives us, but when that becomes our God, when we pursue that, we are having fellowship with things we don't want fellowship with. So as we leave today, man, there's so much more to say. When we leave today, I just love for us as a people to make a declaration of where do we stand. We don't stand with spiritual forces of evil. We don't stand with those realities that want to twist you and turn you and pervert you and to make you something unhuman. And that's where we get that phrase, inhuman. That was an inhumane thing because that's what evil wants to do, twist you into something that's not human. And to declare this together from the book of Joshua, the very last verses in the book of Joshua, because in the book of Joshua, he gives a challenge to the people. I think maybe the Word of God would to give a similar challenge to all of us this morning. Whose side are you on? Are you going to draw near to me? Because there's real evil out there. And so as we do that, I have a couple of slides that I'll read, and I invite us to declare this together as our declaration of faith. If you would stand with me as we do this. And look, no one around you is going to know this. But I really only want you to say it if you really mean it, to really declare where is our allegiance? Because that's exactly what the forces of evil want is your allegiance. So this is the passage in Joshua. Joshua, let's say the word of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord would give this to you today. Therefore, fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity, not with one foot here and one foot there, but in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away all these idols, all these gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt to serve the Lord and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes, look, if you don't want to do this, if you want to give yourself those spiritual forces of evil, if you want to be twisted and perverted, choose this day whom you will serve. Whether you're going to serve them the gods of your fathers serve in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in the lands of you dwell? Who are you going to serve, them or the Lord? And if it's the Lord, let me just invite you, as this screen, next screen comes up, if this is you, raise your hands and let's declare this together with one voice. This is our declaration of faith, of where we stand as renewed people in Christ. Let's declare this together with one voice. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's pray. We thank you, Jesus, our victor, who has overcome these spiritual forces of evil. You put them to shame on the cross. 
And we thank you that we stand in your victory, adorned in your armor and your strength, and we can stand when the devil and his minions come to our gate. We stand in the finished work of Christ. We say, you can go packing. We ain't buying what you're selling. And Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that maybe has opened that door a little bit, we pray right now in the power of the Spirit, we would shut that door fast and hard. We'd repent that we would turn to you. You are a gracious God. You are compassionate and merciful. You are slow to anger and you're abounding in steadfast love. You will forgive us. You will cleanse us and you will cover us with the righteousness of your Son. We all like sheep and go astray. Would you come and bring us back to yourself as we stand not in our righteousness but in yours. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.